Good morning. morning. Welcome as we worship together. Big welcome to those of you who are joining us online or in the fellowship hall. Well, I invite you to send the blue blue friendships down, friendship books down, and uh, put your name, other information there. When you're done, send them back to the center if you would. Uh, Last week, I had some good news for you on the birth of a little, our new, uh, newest member. Today I have some sad news. Uh, some of you know Roberta Hagmeyer, and uh, she has been in a care facility for a while and uh, kind of going downhill. And she just died this last, late this last week. So um, please keep her family in your prayers. I look at the insert this morning and uh, I'm reminded Uh, that we have classes for all ages at 9.30. Today we will be, uh, adults will be gathering here in the sanctuary to uh, look especially at uh, the 10th and 11th chapters of Corinthians, which has a lot to do with the Lord's Prayer. Some very interesting things he says uh, in that setting. He says, when you gather for the Lord's Prayer, excuse me, the Lord's Supper, It is not the Lord's Supper you eat. So, come and see what that's about. No youth group tonight. Uh, Many kids are on break and even out of town. Wednesday evening, once again, we have our uh, Lenten soup supper at 6 and our Lenten worship at 7. That will be our hold and evening prayer service. Uh, LaVon Heidi's memorial service will be this Friday at 11. We anticipate a crowd, and so we invite you to come. Men's barbecue is this Friday. Please notice that it's at Dave's house. That is in Peyton. And then um, our intergenerational craft day is coming up on Saturday. I let you know last week, what did I hold up? Yeah, the bunny. And this is the other craft. What, what is this? You are so good. So good. So uh, if you would like, please sign up for that. I do remind you that uh, the fundraiser for our trip to Appalachia this summer uh, is still going on, and that is filling the big glass pig jar. And if you have change that you would like to collect for that, you are welcome, and then just dump it in the jar. We worship in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I invite you to turn to the front of your hymnals, page 94, for the brief order of confession. Please stand and face the baptismal font. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. 
God, who is rich in mercy, loved us when we were yet dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. front part of your hymnals, page 138. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The prayer of the day is printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Redeemer, in your weakness we have failed to be your messengers of forgiveness and hope in the world. 
Renew us by your Holy Spirit, that we may follow your commands and proclaim your reign of love through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. So many of the kids are on break today that I thought I would simply uh, have you sit where you are. All right, so tell me, what is this? It's a what? Yeah. Tissue box, Kleenex box, whatever that may be. And uh, sometimes if you have a cold, you use this. Um, but what do you use these when, uh, for your eyes? What's, what's happening with your eyes when you use this? They get wet and there's tears. And what kinds of things might cause tears? Sad. Pain. Allergies. Pain. What is it? Joy, joy. Today we're going to hear that just as we cry, just as we shed tears, Jesus did too. And that even when you find yourself alone or concerned or sad or distracted, there is one who is with you and even shares your emotions. We will hear the shortest, what used to be the shortest line in the Bible. Do you know what it is? Jesus, Jesus wept. Today it will be Jesus began to weep. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks that we are never alone. In our hardest moments is when you are the closest. And you even share our tears. Thank you for your amazing love. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Our first lesson is in the 37th chapter of Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, <clears throat> Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, 
Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. <clears throat> We find our second lesson in Romans 8, beginning with the sixth verse. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, then the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Here ends the reading. <laughs> seated. Like the last couple Sundays, this Sunday we also, as you see, have a, quite a long gospel reading. And so I've divided it uh, so that you can take part. Women, which part are you reading? And men? Okay, you got it. Um, and as we did last week, we will read a portion and then pause for some comments. I read just the bottom of your page first. Women, be ready. Hear the Gospel according to John chapter 11. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after hearing that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now that's kind of odd, isn't it? Jesus hears that there's a need, and so he stays rather than goes. Is it because he doesn't care? How do you know? Because we're told that he loves Mary and her sister and Lazarus. So we know that he cares. Hmm. The answer to that question, well, we will visit it two more times. The geography is important. Anybody know where Bethany is? Later, we will get a description in this reading. 
Bethany is a village, small, just east of Jerusalem. It's two miles. You go down the Kidron Valley, up the Mount of Olives, and then over about another mile, and that brings you to Bethany, a little suburb, if you will, of Jerusalem. And where is it that Jesus and his disciples are? They are on the other side of the Jordan River, further east, quite a bit. Now, to get to Jericho, it's going to be about 18 miles by a modern highway. Jesus is actually past Jericho. It's on the plain. How many of you have been to Jericho? Jerusalem. Jerusalem, there you go. Jerusalem is high. It's about 3,000 feet. Uh, 2,500, I think it is. Jericho is very low, almost 1,000. What's the difference? It's 3,500 feet difference of elevation. Think of hiking. If you're going to go from Jericho to Jerusalem, it would be like starting in downtown Colorado Springs and hiking to uh, Woodland Park. How long might that take you? A while. <laughs> it's about 2,500 feet difference in elevation. This is now going to be an extra thousand going from Jericho to Jerusalem. And in fact, it's even going to be longer because it's 18 miles by today's highway, but the Roman highway during Jesus' time probably was 30 miles. It's going to take at least a day, if not longer. But picture hiking from downtown to Woodland Park. We continue. After this, Jesus said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. Now, Jesus has just healed the blind man. We heard about that last week, right? And there was a question that came up. Because Jesus healed the blind man, people began to wonder whether he, Jesus, might be the Messiah. Another word for Messiah is Christ. Remember, Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's his title. It's the coming one. It's the anointed one. It's the chosen one the one who will make all things new. There was a question. When Jesus healed the blind man, could he be the Messiah? That's chapter 9. In chapter 10, people begin wondering this again, and they ask Jesus point blank. Don't keep us in suspense. Are you the Messiah or not? Jesus' response is about a paragraph, but the most important thing in that paragraph, and at the end of it, he says, I and the Father are one. The Jews respond with anger. That's blasphemy, calling oneself God. And so they pick up stones, and they want to do what with the stones? Throw them at him, drop them on him, kill him. Therefore, Jesus and the disciples, after Jesus has healed the blind man, have now gone 18 miles as a crow flies and downhill 3,500 feet to be safe. We pick up the reading. After this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. Pause. Who is the light of the world? Jesus. There it is again. I am the light of the world. Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of the world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not with them. After saying this, he told them, 
Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to waken him. If you remember last time and a couple times before, John's Gospel loves to use words that have more than one meaning. The word sleep, what can it mean? First of all, it can just mean you close your eyes and you knock off for a few minutes. Sleep is what rejuvenates and revives our health. Sleep prepares us for the day. Sleep allows us time where the Lord can be healing us physically, emotionally. Sleep is a good thing. But sleep also can mean what? Death. In the Old Testament, in 1 Kings, we hear David slept with his ancestors. It doesn't mean he laid down in a sleeping bag uh, with a lot of old people who have died. No, it means he died. It says the same thing about Solomon. He slept with his ancestors. Psalm 13 says, Give light to my eyes, O Lord, lest I sleep the sleep of death. And Paul will also speak of these things. He will say in 1 Corinthians, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall awake in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. And he's talking about we shall not all die. Some will have died, but not all. Sleep, even in our culture, can sometimes mean death, but it also just means sleep. So we pick it up. After saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring mainly to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is dead. But for your sake, I was glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. Question. So that you may believe what? That Jesus is the Messiah. That he is the one who raises the dead. He is the one who is God's son. That he is the one who is the author of life itself. He says, let us go to him. Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Now question, when you hear the name Thomas and you know it's the disciple, what do you first think of? We are trained so well. Doubting Thomas. How would you like to be Thomas? Oh, nice to meet you, doubting. Do you know why we jump to that conclusion? What is it? He's always questioning Jesus. And he's always questioning Jesus because every year... The Sunday after Easter, we hear that text. It's the 21st chapter of John. It's a marvelous text, but Thomas keeps getting a bad rap. Thomas the doubter. Thomas who couldn't believe. What's the matter with Thomas? But here, earlier, Jesus has just said, we're going back up the slopes. We're going up to Jerusalem. And the disciples say, are you nuts? They were just trying to kill you. They were trying to stone you. And you're going to go up there again? Jesus says to them again, let us go. Let us go to Lazarus that I may raise him. And now who is it who says, okay, let's go with him? Who is it? What does that mean that Thomas is? I'd say courageous. It's always helpful to read a gospel in full. To read it through. To hear what it's saying. 
Otherwise, we are likely just to get a part of the story. Thomas wanted to see what the other disciples saw, Jesus' hands and feet and the wounds. But now we're reminded that this Thomas is the one who speaks first and tells the rest of the disciples, come on, let's go with him, that we might die with Jesus. Thomas. We go on. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Tell me what that means. What's that? <laughs> We're going to get to the smell. He's been in the tomb four days. Hmm. Let's review just a little bit. At the beginning of the Gospel, the sisters sent a message to Jesus that their brother was ill. How far is it from Jericho to Jerusalem? It's a day's journey at least. It might be more, but let's just call it a day. Let's say that the messenger left from Jerusalem and went downhill to Jericho on Sunday. It would take him approximately a day. It's not on a highway. It's on a windy path. So on Monday, Jesus gets the word. He stays two more days, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then, well, let's say he leaves Thursday to go with his disciples up the 30-mile trek, up the 3,500 feet elevation, and then comes to Jerusalem, Bethany. When he gets there, he finds out that Lazarus has been in the tomb four days. So he died when? Friday, so Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday. Interesting. If my figuring is correctly, the messenger had left, and by the time the messenger got to Jesus, who had died? Lazarus. And so Jesus waiting isn't making any difference. Although the sisters will think it did. Even if Jesus had left right away, he wouldn't have got there in time to keep his friend from dying. Why did he wait? We'll ask that again yet. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Jesus hears Martha's pain. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. He hears her faith. Yet even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, Now, do you catch it? It's Martha's uh, confession of faith. It's what every good Jew believes. That at the end of life, we die. But there will be a day. And that day is when the Messiah comes. 
and he will raise up all those who have died and they will live and stand before him. It's similar to what we confess in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the, Holy, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the... And that's not talking about Jesus. That's not talking Easter. It's talking you. That on the last day, the Messiah will raise up all who have died. That's Jewish belief and Christian belief. She is talking about it in a general way, kind of an objective way. This is what we believe. This is what we anticipate. Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. All of a sudden, the general becomes specific. All of a sudden, the objective becomes personal. This isn't just something that will happen. Jesus says, this is what I will make happen. And in fact, I am that event. I am the resurrection. I am your life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. He asks Martha, do you believe this? She says to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. The question was, do you believe this? It's what our faith centers on. Who is Jesus? Is he just a nice guy? Is he a moral teacher? Is he a great example? Is that what he is? Or is he the very Son of God, the Christ, the Messiah? When she said this, she went back and called her sister Martha and told her privately. The teacher is here and is calling for you. Ah, this one I love. The teacher is here and calling you. Mary, he is calling your name. He knows you. He loves you. He cares about you. He knows what you're going through. He wants you to come to him. He wants you to spend some time with him. He wants you to open up to him so that he can be there for you. The teacher is here and calling for you. Now hear this, not just to Mary, but to you. These are words for you, each of us. The teacher is here. Or when you're home, the teacher is here. Or in your car, or at work, or at school, the teacher is here. And he is calling for you. Well, I'm a little too busy right now. I've got way more important things to do. <laughs> He's calling for you. As we gather for worship, he is here calling for you. As you are home reading the Bible, he is calling, he is there and calling your name. When you're in prayer, when you're thinking about it, or when you're just busy, he is there and he is beckoning, calling your name. I am here for you. I care for you. I know what you're concerned about. And I am with you. The teacher is here, wherever your here is. When she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Don't you love that? She responds. She doesn't simply go, well, I've got a little knitting to do here. I'll be there in about 15 minutes. I got a few phone calls. I'm right in the middle of doing some research on my smartphone. She got up quickly and was coming to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her 
in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet. Don't you love that one? It's what we can do at the communion rail. We come and kneel at his feet. We can do it in our own heart whenever we want. She came, knelt at his feet, and said to him, Do you recognize the words? They're exactly the same as Martha's. Lord, if you had been here. The stress is just a little different though on this one. Lord, if you had been here, my brother, my brother would not have died. Jesus, when he saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. That translation is about as gentle as you can make it. The words actually aren't gentle. When he saw her weeping and the Jews that came with her also weeping, Jesus snorted. It's like a bull. When the bull is calm, when does a bull snort? When it's angry. And in fact, often in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, this word is used to represent and to communicate anger. Snorted. He was greatly disturbed and deeply moved. Would you think he was sad? Well, sure. Lazarus, his friend, has died. But, what's the but? Jesus already knows what. He's going to raise him. That's the whole reason he's come. So I don't think he's terribly disturbed about that one. Maybe he feels badly. The grief and pain of Mary and Martha. Yes. And what does he know they're going to be feeling in about five minutes? Joy. Because their brother's alive. How about mad? The word is snort. I wonder if Jesus is not angry at the enemy who comes always to steal and kill and destroy. Our enemy, the suffering, the pain in our world, an enemy who constantly wants to strip us of our joy and hope. The enemy comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now that is something that Jesus is angry about. Jesus began to weep. Oh. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come to see. Now Jesus began to weep. I've got to think, and this is something that was not in my head at all as a young person. I always thought Jesus total control, kind of out there, watching looking on. But then I came to realize that his promise is that he is with us always. And that he knows what we're going through, he knows what we're thinking, he knows what we're feeling, he knows our griefs and our sorrows, and he knows them so intimately that he himself cries with us. Even when he knows the end. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, but some of them said, Could not 
Then Jesus, again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. As parents, if your child is in trouble, if you see uh, your child experience something that's unfair or dangerous, if there was a dog that was running after them and it looked like it was going to bite them, what are you liable to do? First of all, what are you going to feel? Afraid? I don't think so much afraid as anger. And that gives you such resolve and such focus and such strength that you can take on about anything, even the big bad wolf. Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and the stone was lying against it. What does that remind you of? Jesus' tomb, laid in the tomb, the stone. Good Friday, ah, but also Easter, the stone rolled away. He said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Ah, we already heard that, right? He's been in the tomb four days. There's a stench. He's already, he's, he's been dead four days. Why is this important? Jews believed that a person, when they died, could revive sometime within three days. But after the three days, they were hopeless. Dead and they will stay dead. The magic one was three days. This is what? Four. There is no hope. He's not going to revive. He'll just stay in the tomb. And in fact, there's already a stench. This, perhaps, is why Jesus stayed two more days. So that you could see the glory of God. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out with hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. What is it that binds you? What is it that ties you up? What is it that keeps you from being free? What is it that weighs upon you? Jesus is the one who sets you free. From darkness he brings light. From death he brings life. He is the Messiah. How is it that he is working to set you free? The Messiah. Do you believe him? Amen.
what wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse on my soul, for my soul, oh, dread the dreadful curse for my soul. front part of your hymnals, page 105, with the words of the Apostles' Creed, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to death. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks that death is not the end when it comes to you. You speak a word, and we are made new. We grieve those who have died, but we do not grieve as those without hope. We put our trust in you, the one who raises people from the dead. Lord, help us keep our eyes on you. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, as we wonder about so many things, keep our eyes focused on you. Help us to put our hope and our trust firmly in your hands. 
You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You will come again. You will raise us back up. And in the meantime, you are about the work of setting us free. Lord, take what binds us, that keeps our hands from good work, that keeps our eyes from seeing, that keep our feet from moving in the direction that you would have us. Unbind us and let us go. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are with child, that your hand would be upon them and the little one inside. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the deployed, Brittany, Christian, and Matthew, that your hand would rest upon each of them as they are far from home. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our missionary, Didi, his wife, Serafina, that you would be strengthening them, filling them with your goodness to overflowing into the lives of those who are in the Congo of Africa. Lord, in your mercy. And we pray for Kelly, Dorothy, Laura, Electa, Lynn, Mike, Don, Dave, Duane, and all those we mention silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Share God's peace with one another.
The offering prayer is printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let, lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this, remembering me. After supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this, remembering me. We pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The body of Christ, broken for you. The one who gives life to the dead and sight to the blind invites you to come and be filled at his table. As you come forward, form two lines, kneel or stand as you are able. When you are finished, place your empty glass in a basket and return to your place. Please be seated. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh
sinners here, things life and death and peace. He speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The mortal burden broke rejoice, the humble Go in peace, serve the Lord.